Hello, I'm Iman Fouad, a third year PhD student at INRIA. I'm working on detection and measurement of web tracking, and today I'm happy to present you our paper on trackers detection via invisible pixels. Lately, we've all been concerned about the coronavirus pandemic, and I suppose that you've all been at least once to the World Health Organization website. But how many of you did actually check the number of third parties inside the website? For those of you who did not, we have more than 10 third parties. Including third party content became a common practice for website developers. It makes building and maintaining websites easier, but this came with the privacy costs. Third parties can actually track users across websites. Let's see how it works. We present the user's browser in a blue box. Inside the browser, we have the cookie database, and in that example, we suppose that we have doubleclick.net's cookie in the browser. Let's take this navigation example. Let's say that the user first went to the World Health Organization website that have content from doubleclick.net. We present doubleclick.net server on the right in the red box. In order to fetch the content, a request will be sent to doubleclick and the browser will automatically attach its cookies. Using this request, doubleclick will get to know that the user 1234 visited the World Health Organization. Let's say that later on the user went to youtube.com and then to amazon.com that have content from the same third party. So once again, we'll have a request to double click and using the second request, it will get to know that the user who was visiting the World Health Organization before is now visiting amazon.com. Basically, double click is recreating part of the user's browsing history or what we refer to as the user's profile. The collection of this data will improve the quality of ads. Companies may offer you products you didn't even know you're interested in before, which is very profit-making for advertising companies, but it's very intrusive for the user's privacy. In order to collect this data, companies can perform multiple and complex tracking behaviors. So how tracking is actually done in the wild? During this talk, we'll answer this question using our tracking detection methodology based on invisible pixels or invisible images. When we first started our study, we were looking into the type of content inside websites, and we've noticed that in most of these websites, we have invisible pixels. They cannot be seen by the user, but they can still enable tracking. Reason why, we decided to look into uh, different request responses leading to these invisible pixels, extract tracking behaviors from these request responses, make a classification of these tracking behaviors, and apply this classification to the full dataset. This figure summarizes the main five steps that you follow to uh, detect different tracking behaviors. I will guide you through this figure during the talk. In order to detect trackers, we first needed to simulate the user behavior, both the different websites and collect the data. For that, we used OpenWPM, an open source crawler. We called Alexa top 10,000 domains in February 2019. The call was done in a stateful way, meaning that we only used one browser instance and kept the user's profile, including cookies and browser storage between sites' visits. For each domain, we visit the homepage and 10 first links. As a result, we successfully called 8,700 domains with a total of 84,600 pages. As a result of our call, we've collected cookies, HTTP request responses, and the, the images included in the website. We analyzed these images, extracted those that are invisible pixels, and grouped the request responses leading to these invisible pixels into a subdataset that we refer to as pixels subdataset. As a result of our call, we've collected over 2 million images. By analyzing them, we found that more than 35% of these images are invisible pixels. In summary, 95% of the domains that we've uh, visited contain at least one invisible pixels. To sum up, Invisible pixels are a perfect suspect for tracking, by, but they are also widely present in the web. The third step was to detect identifier cookies. Not all cookies are used for identification purposes. In order to distinguish users, trackers associate them with different cookies. And so an identifier cookie should be unique per user or user specific. To filter out non-user specific cookies, we made the second call of the Alexa top 10,000 domains from a distant machine. Then we filtered out the cookies with the same host name value across the two calls. The fourth step was to detect identifier sharing. I will not go into details for this step, but you can still refer to the paper to read more about the six different methodologies that we performed to detect this sharing. Using this detection of identifier sharing inside the pixel subdataset, we made a classification of different tracking behaviors 
and then we apply it to the full data set uh, independently from what kind of content is served. We first split our tracking categories into cross-site tracking and analytics because of their different privacy impact. We've seen before that cross-site tracking enables recreation of part of the user's browsing history, while analytics enables tracking within the same website, which is less harmful for the user's privacy. In this talk, I will focus on the cross-site tracking. We split it into two main classes, explicit cross-site tracking, where the trackers rely on third-party cookie, and then we have the cookie syncing that relies on the sharing of the identifier. I will start with the explicit cross-site tracking. In each of the class, I'll give one example, and again, for the remaining tracking categories, you can refer to the paper. Today, I'll present you what we refer to as basic tracking in Sharebyte Tracker that is present on over 82% of the websites that we've visited. So let's see how it works. Coming back to our example, let's say that the user is visiting the World Health Organization that have content from adnexs.com. Again, a request will be sent to adnexs to fetch this content. Adding access sets a third-party cookie on the user's browser, but we've noticed that in this kind of behavior, adding access through direct the request to its partner, in this case doubleclick.net, either via HTTP redirection by referring to the doubleclick.net's URL inside the location header, or via or by including content from doubleclick.net. Using this request, doubleclick sets a third-party cookie on the user's browser. Using this kind of behaviors, domains can track users on websites where they were not initially included, which makes it even harder for the website developers to maintain all the tracking that is happening in their websites, especially that they can even be not aware of the tracking happening by doubleclick.net in this example. We found this kind of behavior in 82% of the domains. In this figure, we present the top 15 domains performing uh, basic tracking initiated by another tracker. In the x-axis, we have the domain names of the domains that are indirectly included. In the y-axis, we have the percentage of first-party domains. As you can see, google.com is the top domain being indirectly included. It's uh, included in over 60% of the websites. So basically, google.com, by only relying on this kind of behavior, can recreate 60% of the user's profile without even having a content on the website. Now, moving to the second class, cookie syncing, I will present to you what we refer to as third-party cookie forwarding that is present on over 7% of the websites. Coming back to our example, the user is visiting the World Health Organization, and now let's suppose that inside the website we have content from artrue.com. A request will be sent to artrue to fetch this content, and we've noticed that in ki this kind of behavior, uh, the third-party trackers are including analytics services. In this example, artro.com is including Google Analytics scripts. I'm marking green uh, the analytics services, in red the third-party trackers. The script will set a cookie on the user's browser with as domain artro.com. And so by definition, the cookie is a third-party cookie. Then it will send the request to Google Analytics with as part of the parameters the third-party cookie. Using this request, Google Analytics will get to know that the user 123 sorry, visited the World Health Organization. Later on, let's say that the user goes to a different website, Amazon.fr, that have the same content from artro.com with the embedded analytics script. So once again, we'll have this, uh, the, the request sent to Google Analytics with the third-party cookie, and this time Google Analytics will get to know that the user 123, who was visiting the World Health Organization before, is now visiting Amazon.fr. And so Google Analytics is no longer behaving as an analytics service. Instead, it's cross-site tracking the user since it's able to link its activity, um, since it's able to link the user's activity across different websites. In summary, due to this behavior and inclusion of content, analytics service are uh, able to cross-site trackers, to cross-site users, sorry. We found this kind of behavior on 7.26% of the domains that we've analyzed. We found 386 unique partners that forward cookies, among which 271 are forwarding cookies to googleanalytics.com. And so Google Analytics by itself is cross-site tracking the user on 4% of the websites. In summary, we detected six different tracking categories, and we found at least one type of tracking category 
on 92% of the domains that we've analyzed. In these figures, we present on the right companies, on the left domains that perform either analytics that we present in yellow, cross-site tracking in red, or both analytics and cross-site tracking inside the, web the same website in brown. As you can see, domains such as Google Analytics can perform both analytics and cross-site uh, cross tracking, uh, cross tracking behaviors. Next, we want to understand what kind of content is used to track users. We started our study using invisible images to detect tracking behaviors and make the classification. But then we applied this classification to the full dataset with all kind of content. And so uh, we want to see more generally uh, the content used with tracking requests. In this table, we present the top five um, contents used with these tracking requests. And as you can see, not only invisible images are used, but also HTML files and scripts that could be really useful for the good functioning of the website. Given how intrusive is web tracking for the user's privacy, it was normal to see that in the last decade, the research field on the web tracking exploded. More and more researchers were interested in the detection and measurement of web tracking. But most of these works detected trackers with filter lists. Only until 2018, most measurement studies detected trackers with easiest and easy privacy. <coughs> in this table, we present papers published in top venues from 2016 to 2018 that relies either on easy lists, easy privacy, or both combined. These filter lists rely on regular expressions, which, which makes it easy for these filter lists to miss unknown trackers. And given how they became a de facto approach in our community to detect trackers, it was normal to ask how efficient are these filter lists at detecting trackers. To answer this question, we studied two filter lists, Easy List and Easy Privacy, that is used with Adblock Plus, Adblock and UBlock Origin, and moreover, it's widely used in our community, and Disconnect, that is used with Disconnect Extension, and in tracking pro protections are integrated with uh, Firefox Browser. We compared our tracking detection methodology that we refer to as behavior track to disconnect on the right and easy is easy privacy on the left. We mark, let's start with easy is and easy privacy. We mark in blue circle the requests that were detected as tracking requests by easy is and easy privacy. And in pink circle we present the requests that were detected as tracking requests by our methodology behavior track. So as you can see, over 19% of the requests, tracking requests detected by our methodology were missed by easy and easy privacy, while over 16% of the tracking requests detected by our methodology behavior track were missed by disconnect. So next, we want to understand why filter lists miss those trackers. The first reason is the users of usage of first-party cookies um, in a third-party context. Let's take this example. They say that the user visits google.com or just happened to open her browser. So if you're using Chrome browser, then google.com will be your page by default. What happens is that a request will be sent to google.com to fetch the content. Google.com will then send, set a first party cookie in your browser, an NID cookie. Using this cookie, google.com get to know that uh, this user 1234 visited google.com at this given time. So later on, let's say that the user visits w3schools.com, for example, that have content from Google search engine. So now a request will be sent to Google search engine to fetch this content. Along with the request, the browser will automatically attach the cookie that was set in a first-party context but is now used as a third-party tracking, tra tracking cookie sorry, to Google search engine. Using this cookie, Google search engine will get to know that the user 1234 who was visiting google.com before is now visiting w3schools.com. So basically, Google.com search engine is recreating the user's profile, but the filter list cannot block the request Google search engine in this website because um, in this context, Google search engine is providing functional content for the website, w3schools.com. We found that 32% uh, of the requests that were missed by easy and easy privacy and 45% of those missed by disconnect were using first party cookies or cookies set in a first party context. In summary, initially first party tracking cookies are sent with requests to fetch functional third party content. So when the cookie was set, it was set in a first party context and so the filter list did not block it at this point because it was not tracking request or tracking cookie at this point. Then later on when the request was using the cookie in a third party context, it was not uh, 
possible for the filter to block request at this point again because um, the cookie was used with functional content and so the blockage of this request that serves functional content could have led to the breakage of the website that uses this content. The second reason is the usage of large scope cookies. A domain can choose to set the cookie with the second level TLD, such as google.com, instead of using the full domain, for example, search engine.google.com. By doing so, the cookie became accessible to all subdomains. We found that 77% of the missed requests by Easiest and Easy Privacy use a second level TLD, while 75% of uh, those missed by Disconnect use a second level TLD cookie. In summary, cookies set with second level TLDs are sent with requests to fetch third-party content from all subdomains, including those that serve functional content. And once again, filterless cannot block this kind of request because of the functionality that they bring to the website. Uh, the last question that we want to answer is how efficient are browsers' extension in blocking all these trackers? We compared the efficiency of browsers' extensions to our three main classes, or to our, to our three classes, explicit cross-site tracking that we mark in red, cookie syncing that we mark in blue, and finally, analytics that we mark in yellow. In this figure, we present the efficiency of browsers' extension in blocking tracking requests. Uh, in the x-axis, we have the browsers' extensions that we've studied, add block, disconnect, privacy badger, and finally costery. In the y-axis, we have the percentage of tracking third-party requests that were missed by this uh, browser's extension. As you can see, Ghostery is the most efficient among the browser's extensions, but it still failed to, uh, to block over 26% of the requests that were detected by our methodology behavior track as tracking requests. And so, to conclude, we analyze the invisible pixels that are widely present on the web and are perfect suspects for, suspects for tracking to define a new classification of our tracking behaviors. We then apply this classification to all kinds of content to the full dataset and compare the two uh, browsers extensions and uh, filter lists. We show that even the most popular consumer protection lists such as Easy, Easy Privacy or Disconnect and browsers extensions fail to detect these complex behaviors. We also show that domains serving useful content may track the user as well, which leads to the conclusion that between protecting our privacy or keeping the functionality of websites, we clearly need a more fine-grade approach to detect tracking. For any further details, please don't hesitate to refer to our paper Missed by Filter List Detecting Unknown Third-Party Trackers with Invisible Pixels. Thank you for your attention.